All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Santiago. I am the president of Hearthstone Ventures. Um, today, I'm very ha happy to um, have Julie Gates um, here with us. Julie is an entrepreneur and real estate investor in Savannah, Georgia. She specializes in short-term rentals. Her favorite rental model is what she calls a long short, um, which is furnished rentals with a minimum stay of 30 nights or more. Julie started her short-term rental management company, Sid Was Here, in 2017, which was named for a baby squirrel her son rescued. The company has grown to over 50 properties in the Savannah area and around the United States. Julie enjoys the creativity and customer service aspects of working with short-term rental homes. She also believes that the use of technology is the most important aspect of her work. Julie has grown Sid Was Here through partnerships with multiple tech companies. A licensed speech therapist, Julie completed a certification in revenue management from the prestigious Cornell University School of Hotel Administration in 2021. Julie and her husband, Don, have been married over 20 years and have built multiple businesses together. They have two boys and enjoy adventurous travel. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Julie um, go ahead and take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Is everybody in Austin, Joanne, or, or is it, are we spread out? Uh, we are spread out. Okay, great. I like Austin. I have a, a property I manage in Georgetown, actually, which isn't too far. So oh, yes. I've been trying to attract the tech crowd. And it is a long short. It is a 30 day or more. Uh, we do a lot with professionals that are traveling around, a lot of tech professionals. So I love Austin. It's oh. great. But thank you for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I know everyone here is into, uh, or at least trying to get into real estate investing. And let me just hit the present here. This is just a little bit better. So um, what I want to talk to you guys about today is called the share, shared economy. Um, I'm sure that you've heard of this, but we're going to kind of have a deep dive, maybe a weird dive into it. And um, I hope that you'll enjoy it. I uh, I like being unique. That's probably one of my favorite things is to not be like anyone else. So hopefully this presentation will be, you know, unlike anything else that you've heard. And um, I really, I know everybody's always looking for cash flow and everyone's always looking for a way to buy real estate. And I'm no exception. I'm in the same exact boat. And so once I found the shared economy, it was, a, it was a life changer for me. And so um, I'm just going to throw a lot of stuff at you guys, and I hope that maybe something will hit you in between the eyes and you go, I could totally make money at that. And then you can turn that into great deals or put it into, you know, a raise or buy real estate yourself, you know, whatever you're looking for. So that's kind of our goal tonight. Um, my presentation, as you can see, is called How to Cash Flow on Your Cat. Uh, there are literally a million ways to cash flow and and save that money. So that's what we're going to speak about tonight. And again, my name is Julie Gates, um, in case you missed that intro. I always like to tell people you are living in your launch pad. This is true for me. It's true for you. It's true for everyone. There's something in your life right now that could be used as a launch pad. You just haven't realized it yet. And for me, once I realized what my launch pad was, uh, I took off like a rocket. It was like real estate being able to come up with the money to pay for real estate was a lot easier. And I just had to make stuff cash flow that I already had in my life. And it sounds ridiculously simple. Uh, and, but it's absolutely true. So there's something in your life that is a launch pad and you can use it, you know, to buy real estate and a lot of it, hopefully. So really the concept that we're going to talk about is taking a liability and turning it into an asset. So something you have right now that is not making you a dime, it's probably costing you money. If you figure out what that is and how to do it, you can turn that into cash flow. All right. Um, just a little bit about me and, and Joanne kind of touched on this. Uh, this is my logo. It's a squirrel. Uh, my company is called Sid Was Here. I live and breathe every day in the shared economy. Everything I'm talking to you about tonight, I am doing myself. I do think that it's important to be authentic. I'm not going to tell you about metaparticle physics. I would be terrible at that. But the shared economy is something that I use all the time and I'm a, just a huge believer in it. And I just love being able to tell people about it and make them go, oh my gosh, I could do that. I know I could do that. Um, I've seen it in many lives. And so that's what I'm 
really excited about. So uh, I am a real estate investor. I've been buying real estate for a long time. Back in 2017, I had really uh, pivoted to wanting to buy single family real estate uh, for my own portfolio for rentals. I was just, I don't know, I just really dialed into that. We had been working towards commercial until then. And very quickly I said, man, I'm having a hard time coming up with the down payments. It's, it's expensive as you all very well know. It's not, I don't have 20,000 sitting around every day to buy a house with. So I said, man, I've, I'm living on my launch pad. I know I've got a launch pad. What do I do? And at that time I really became acquainted with Airbnb. And I said, wow, you know, that seems a little too easy. And here in Savannah, I have a pool house and it was already furnished. We purposely did not have any neighbors. We live on some property. And uh, I just begged my husband. I said, please let me Airbnb my pool house. Please, please, please. And he's like, I don't want people back there. And I said, well, it's just two or three nights. It's not like they're going to be there six years. You know, we're not doing a year lease. And when you live right next door to a property, that's actually kind of a positive where you go, okay, they'll be gone on Monday. It's fine. So I got my husband to agree and I started renting out my pool house and it, I just fell in love with Airbnb, with short-term rentals, with the shared economy in general. I just couldn't believe, you know, how much I loved it. So just so you understand, I'm just living in this every day and, and things have kind of evolved from there. I started my management company, Sid was here just for my own purposes and then ended up renting for or managing for other people, never, ever planned on it. I'm sure many of you are actually doing things today that you never would have planned on either. You know, that's kind of how life works. So I am, I love what I do and it's a lot of fun. So I hope that you'll take a little bit of inspiration. Not everyone's going to do Airbnb, but I just want you to know that that's how I got started. So the first question is really, what is the shared economy? I'm sure many of you have heard this concept, may or may not. Uh, Wikipedia describes it as a, a socioeconomic system built around the sharing of resources. Okay, so Again, the concept is you have something and you can share it and get paid for it. And it doesn't have to be a house. It doesn't have to be anything that your average Joe would think of. It could, it can literally be anything. It can be, your, you can cash flow on your toddler in the shared economy. There's all kinds of ways to make cash flow. It's incredible the opportunities that we have now in 2021. Um, anything in 2021 is an asset. Your house can be an asset that you live in, your car, your dog your toilet, your casket, your bridesmaids, your friends, and even your cat can be an asset. And this is 1000% true. I am not making any of this up. These are all things that people are cash flowing on right now. So again, there's something in your life that's a launch pad. You just don't know what it is yet. You just have to identify it. Uh, so back to my title, cash flow on your cat. I want you to meet Kobe the cat. Kobe's on Instagram. Uh, Kobe is actually everywhere, but I screenshotted Kobe's Instagram at the time. This is probably a month and a half ago. I screenshotted this. He had 2,200 posts and um, 1.9 million followers. Okay. Kobe, the cat was adopted as a kitten by a couple and they noticed that he had really cute guy liner as they call it. And so they started photographing him and they put him up on social media and then they kept putting him up on social media and then they put him up some more. And pretty soon he got a pretty big following and he got sponsorships and he got billboards and Kobe, the cat for 2021, I hope you're sitting down is expected to make over $5 million just this year. Okay. His owners do nothing but cash flow on him. Like that's their entire job is to put their cat on Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is they're on every day. So it is completely possible to cash flow on your cat, 5 million. That's crazy. And that's a true story. And uh, you go to any social media site, you're going to see funny pets. Some of them may have ads. I mean, that's someone that's cash flowing. Like if you can sell the rights to your cat or let's say kitten, kitten caboodle or whatever, you're going to cash flow on that cat. Like it happens every day. So how did I get started? Uh, like I said, my first foray into the uh, shared economy was with my pool house. It's called the Quiet Coastal Home. Uh, the numbers in the circles are actual gross numbers that I have received on both homes. And this is real money. This is money that can I have turned into real estate. I did not spend it on shoes, even though I would love to. Uh, I did, you know, save it up and buy more stuff with it. So I started with my pool house and I loved it. And we had another home just on our property adjacent to our property. We had bought the neighbor's property years before and we, it was being used as storage. And I said, I love this so much. I'm going to create 
another one of these. So that became Starfish House. So on my property right now, I have two Airbnbs and they do very well. I love working in them very much. And so the Quiet Coastal Home helped me rehab and get going on Starfish. And then now that I have the two of these, those launched me, those were my launch pad. And I started buying more and more Airbnbs and more and more real estate. And these two homes have just been a huge blessing to me. And these were definitely my launch pad. Okay. So I just want you to see the numbers. These are not to brag by any means, but I want you to go, okay, this is not, she's not talking $50 a week. It, this can be real money. If you do well at it, you work at it, you make it nice. Um, the shared economy has made a huge difference in my life as far as being able to buy additional cash flowing real estate. Right. So I actually truth, 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 get paid to live in my home. Uh, so this is my uh, diagram on that. I, I live in my home every day and I get paid to be here. I have multiple streams of income on this property. The first is my guest house, my pool house. I rent it out as a nightly rental. And then I have a HELOC on both houses. Okay. That is my primary re residence. I got a HELOC for free. They didn't even charge me any closing costs. Okay. It's a very nice size HELOC, home equity, home equity line of credit. So now when I buy real estate, I am able to pay cash for it, you know, or if I need a certain amount, I just come in with cash. I pull it out of my HELOC. Then I do a cash out refi on the property. I get my cash back and I pay it back into my home equity line of credit. So just having that has been a huge blessing to me to be able to buy single family homes in cash is a huge advantage, but I don't actually have the cash. I just pull it out of my HELOC off of my home. So my home is constantly generating that income for me where I can buy more real estate. Again, I also have starfish on my property. Uh, and I also rent it out as a nightly rental. And I've also rented it out. It's on quite a large acre. It's on five acres of land. So I've rented it out for movies. I've rented it out for events. And I also do allow people to store property there from time to time, not all the time, uh, but I do allow that. So that's four streams of income for me to get paid to live here. And all that money, I just put it aside and hang on to it till I need something. And it's, it's a huge blessing. This is all something that you all can do as well. You've just got to find that launch pad. But for me, this is what really got me moving much quicker in real estate. Okay. I was kind of just plodding along before I got into the shared economy. And then once I really got into it, I was like, wow, you know, I'm able to come up with these down payments so much quicker. It was, it was just great. So I really, again, want to share with you, this is something I'm doing every day. And I know every one of you guys can as well. So the biggest concept with a shared economy is, um, we, you know, you can turn a liability into an asset and get what you want. I wanted real estate. Some people want to travel and that's totally fine. It, you can buy anything you want. You just have to have a goal and that's going to motivate you to get to work. Okay. Is having that goal. If you don't know what you want to buy, you may or may not be all that, you know, motivated. Uh, some people need college, but with the shared economy, I just want you to know the sky is totally the limit. I want to talk to you about my friend, Tina. She's um, a very, very, very good friend of mine. And I was spending some time with her a few years ago and she was lamenting about college. She said, I do not have my kids college saved up. And I'm nervous because she had a child, several children in high school. And I said, well, you're living in your launch pad. You know, what do you have? What can you put on the shared economy? And she was like, oh, you know, I don't know. It, that's the hard question, honestly, is, is just figuring out the first thing that you can do. So, and, you know, we got talking about it and um, I said, you have a farm. Like they had this little farm and it was about 45 minutes from their home and they were driving out and feeding the animals, really enjoying it. I said, what about your farm? You should put that on Airbnb. No, no one would want to rent that. It's, kind of, you know, it's a hundred year old house. And I said, you know, you never know until you try it. I never thought anyone would want to rent my pool house. And so um, she did and she loved it. And I talked to her six months later and um, she said, I paid cash for college. She enrolled her daughter in college and she paid cash for tuition. And it was because she took a liability and turned it into an asset and she already had it. I mean, she didn't even buy any, you know, she bought some sheets and some plates or whatever, but I'm saying she didn't even buy a property. She had it. Maybe you have something in your family that they would let you cash flow on even two months a year. I mean, there, there's some asset in your, there's some liability in your life that you can turn into an asset. And I was so happy for her. Like that was a really big deal for her to have that money sitting there and pay cash for that. And her daughter didn't have to go into debt. 
you know, for her, that was just a huge motivator and it was just fantastic. Um, but the greatest thing about my girl, Tina, is she didn't just stop there. Okay. She, once she got a hold of the shared economy and got the concept, she got really excited about it and she kept going. So she's actually killing it. So her first step was the farmhouse. She put it on Airbnb. Okay. Then she started noticing the guests were really asking about the animals. They love seeing the cows and the chickens and the horses and you know, they're asking, they're asking. So she started, she set up her barn. She put the food out. She labeled everything. She put out places to feed them. Next thing you know, she's not driving out to the farm one or two, three days a week to feed the animals. She had her guests paying her to stay on her property. And then the guests were feeding the animals. So it's saving her work, which I thought was pretty brilliant that she got people to pay her to feed her animals. Like brilliant. Okay. The next thing she did, she got so excited because everyone loves being around these animals she bought these little campers, the little tow behind trailers. She fixed them up nice. She got them for very, a very low price. I don't remember what, but I think I know one of them was less than $10,000. I think both of them were because people toss these things out. They get sick of them. She was able to get a hold of two of them. She made them really cute. She put them on the other side of the property. So they were not near the other guests and they each kind of had their own separate thing. Now she has three sources of income and the same, she never bought another property. Okay. So she took one property with one house, made it one source of income. Now she's got the feeding. Now she has campers that are cash flowing. Then she took the barn. She's very good at decorating. She made her barn really cute. She started kind of decorating it. She took this huge hay wagon, took off the sides and made it into this giant table that'll seat probably 30 people. I mean, it's huge table, but it's a, it's an old wagon. A, yeah. Wagon. Am I saying that right? Yeah. A wagon trailer or something. Anyway, she put benches around it. She decorated it, put hay everywhere. So she started renting out her barn for events and weddings. You know, people like, like a farm wedding or a country wedding or a country theme party or whatever. She did the um, group area. So next thing you know, this farm that was a liability a year previous now has four sources of income and she's not even working there that much because the guests are feeding the animal animals. And um, it was just, bro I was just, I've been amazed to watch her take this one asset and just churn money, churn money, churn money. And I mean, I have no idea what she's made off of it, but I'm just so happy for her. She's enjoyed the whole thing. Um, it's helped her put in a lot of improvements onto her property, you know, with a tax write-off. And it's just been a huge blessing for her just getting into the shared economy and learning, you know, how to cash flow. So I promise you, if I can do it and Tina can do it, every one of you has something. You just, you just have to identify it. A lot of times that's the, that's the hard part, you know? So uh, when you're looking at what to invest in, how to use the shared economy, the biggest thing I can recommend is being creative. I love being creative. I told you at the beginning, I really enjoy being different and, that's the perfect thing for the shared economy because, you know, just talking about the Airbnb space, which is what I come from, but you may be something different, but the weirder or the more unique your Airbnb is, the more it's going to get booked, right? Because people love a good experience. So I really encourage you, no matter what you do with this information, be creative, try to stand out. Don't try to be like everybody else, purposely go the other way and be, be interesting. And that's what gets people's attention. And it makes them want to rent your stuff, honestly. Uh, look around your house. What is collecting dust? What isn't being used? There's something there in your home right now that's an asset. I truly believe it. I've talked to some crazy people after I talked to them and they came up with some really great stuff. Uh, you know, there are people on YouTube that cash flow on their toddler right now. They turn on the camera, they hand their child a new, you know, play skill toy and they video their child opening it and playing with it. And there are millions of kids all over the world watching that. And now they have an ads account. They're cash flowing on their two-year-old. I mean, anything is an asset. Have I said that enough? You have something that you can cash flow on, anything. Uh, if there's any special skill that you have that maybe no one else has, that's something that you can probably cash flow on. And a big secret to that is the shared economy. There's an app for almost everything. So I know I keep saying it, but I do want to talk about Airbnb because they are kind of the shared economy leader. They kind of turned this industry on its ear uh, and they are a big part of my life. And I don't feel like they get enough credit. They get a lot of heat. So I just, just give me a moment to just give them a shout out because I do love Airbnb and I'm sure many of you have stayed in them. And it's, it's a wonderful experience to be able to, you know, 
travel with your family and have an entire home to yourself in a kitchen. So uh, they are, you know, kind of considered the shared economy leader. So anyway, excuse me as I kiss up just a little bit because they are wonderful. Um, Airbnb is really changing the world. Um, they're helping minority and elderly communities a ton. It is amazing. You know, like anyone can be an Airbnb host. Everyone has a place to live and anyone can turn the place that they're living in into a launch pad into a cash flow machine. So Airbnb has really made that very simple to do. 55% um, of the hosts are women. It's a huge opportunity for women to have their own small business. And that's a big deal. And what does that bring in? Brings in cash flow. So uh, it's really made a difference for women. Uh, senior citizens are doing well. Uh, they have over 400,000 senior hosts um, and women are rated to be the best. And it's also helped people stay in their homes with home affordability. I do have a, a good friend, Lisa, and she stayed in an Airbnb in Florida and it was hosted by an elderly lady and it was inside her home. And my friend Lisa and her son were staying in the master bedroom and she was asking the lady, she said, why do you Airbnb your home? And the lady said, my husband died. I can't afford this home by myself anymore. She said, but being able to be an Airbnb host has allowed me to stay here. And that's a huge deal. I mean, you don't wish for anyone to have to leave their home that they've been in 20, 30, 40 years, you know, because of money. So it, it does give a lot of just regular Joes like myself, the opportunity to take their home, share it with others and, and make a profit from that. And it's, it's a very simple concept, but it's a great concept. So I do want to give them a shout out on that. Um, other platforms I know you have heard of, but I just want to bring to your attention because maybe you should use one. Uh, Uber and Lyft, they've become huge in COVID. Uh, you click an app and you get a ride immediately. It's so much easier you know, than hailing a taxi. Um, one thing I really want to point out, which I think is a humongous deal, is that it is estimated that Uber and Lyft have uh, re reduced drunk driving by 25 to 35%. That's the shared economy really changing the world. I'm really proud of that. There's, in my opinion, forgive me, there's no reason to drive drunk anymore. You need to open the app on your phone, get an Uber and get a ride home. Like before that wasn't possible. You can kind of see why people ended up driving home, but now it's like, Hey, just get an Uber. If you can't drive, it's okay. Nobody, no questions asked, you know? So, and every time you do get an Uber and Lyft, that's someone that's taking their car and putting it on the shared economy and turning that liability into an asset. And that's a great thing. That's fantastic. Uh, Turo, you can rent your car when you're not using it. Uh, Turo is a great app. Uh, they do allow 21-year-olds to rent, which is awesome. They have phenomenal insurance. I know many people are using Turo. And it's also a great way to buy yourself a luxury car that you can't really afford. And if you put it on Turo, you know, a few days or weeks a month, a lot of times that's going to pay your whole car payment and you're still able to enjoy that automobile. So um, it's just one more way that the shared economy is really coming through and making things very affordable. Uh, the other thing is Postmates, Uber Eats, and DoorDash. This is, again, a shared economy concept. It's an app. And then, you know, someone who got off work early is driving people suppers on their way home, you know, making some money. So the shared economy is it's everywhere. We just don't always realize that, wow, what a blessing that that guy is making their car into an asset and, and bringing me my Chinese, uh, you know, deliciousness that I ordered from the local store. So some other things in my box, I want to point out to you, there's just so many shared economy sites. It's really, it's cool how many options there are out there. Uh, Airbnb is one that I'm absolutely obsessed with. I um, am trying, I don't know who owns it, but I desperately want it to come back. It is not working right now, uh, but this is a fantastic one. Um, the concept for Airbnb is that you would go to a large event, let's say Mardi Gras in New Orleans, okay? Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And if you've ever been to these events, there is nowhere to go to the bathroom, zero. And if there is, it's disgusting, okay? I know you know what I'm talking about. So this is just the shared economy solving a problem. So on Airbnb, when they came up with this concept, what you would do, it's exactly like Airbnb, but it's just for your toilet, okay? So you, let's say I live... Uh, near where the Mardi Gras parade is. I live very close by for, I don't, but let's say I did. Uh, I would take a picture of my toilet and maybe a couple other fabulous photos of my entryway or something, I don't know. You know, let's say you have a half bath, just right there, take a picture. You put it on Airbnb and I'm gonna say, okay, if you wanna use my toilet, it's gonna be eight bucks. Take it or leave it. I really don't care, it's fine, it's Mardi Gras. I need to go to the bathroom. 
I don't want to use the porta potty. So I go to Airbnb and it tells me based on my location, if there's a toilet nearby and I can see photos, I can see reviews. Like it's awesome. I want this so bad. And you click on it, you pay your eight bucks. And then the homeowner gets the notification. Julie has booked your Airbnb. She'll be arriving shortly. You let her in. She uses your facilities. She leaves. She gives you a great review. You give her a great review. You get eight bucks. She gets a great experience. It's a win-win. I need you guys to help me get this website back. I just, I'm sorry. I like weird stuff, but I just think the concept is so funny uh, for these big events. So anyway, Airbnb, if anyone knows anyone, Hey, you guys are in Austin. Some of you guys should know a tech guy that can bring this back. I, I will sign the petition. If anyone can help me with this. Um, there are many, many websites where doctors can give a second opinion. We now have doctors sitting on their couches in their underwear, uh, giving a second opinion. Any specialist can register as a specialist on these websites. And then you as the patient, let's say you have a negative, maybe a colonoscopy and you don't like the result and you want a second opinion. Well, it's a pain in the neck to go get pre-approved and drive across town and make an appointment for six months from now and wear a mask. I mean, good gravy, it's crazy. So these websites are fantastic in that you can book with, let's say a GI specialist, you know, board certified, like legit GI doc. I upload, I scan and upload my medical uh, records. This guy is going to look at it at his convenience and send it back to me within 24 hours. And I pay a fee on, you know, I don't know what that fee is, but um, as a doctor or a professional, it is possible to cash flow and, and, you know, maybe cut back at work a little bit and sit on your couch and still do consults. Like it's a really great concept. I'm seeing this everywhere now. And a lot of physicians are excited because they're burned out and they'd love to have a source of income, but not have to show up at the office every day. I really do think this is kind of where medicine is moving. Let's say you want to go on vacation, but you want to stay for free. You can get registered on a pet sitting site. There are going to background check you, make sure that you're not a bad person. Uh, but let's say I want to go to Paris for three weeks. Well, I go to this website. There are several and people put up their house where it's located, what kind of pet they have. And I'm going to say, hey, I'm Julie. I would love to pet sit for you in your Parisian home. These are my dates. And if they approve me, they're going to leave instructions. I'm going to stay in their home, walk their dog, feed their dog, pet their dog, whatever. But I'm also going to be out every day, you know, sightseeing. It's not like you're stuck in the home, but it's a very, very affordable way to travel is to pet sit. And as you guys know, if you have a pet, it's very expensive to board a pet and it's very hard on the pet to be in a, you know, a kennel. So it's really a win-win for the homeowner and also for the traveler to have this pet sitting option. So they're just, I mean, that's crazy, but you're cash flowing on someone else's pet in that circumstance. Um, we have location scouts that are always looking and you'll get paid if you spot that thing as you're out driving, you know, let's say they're looking for a blue barn. You say, hey, I found a blue barn. Here's a photo. You might get, you know, some money for that. Uh, Joanna, I'm not sure how many of your guys might have a multifamily complex, but if you have a basketball court or a tennis court or a pool or a great parking lot. Let's say your parking lot is near the Dolphin Stadium. You should be renting that out for parking at 50 bucks a car. You know, there's different ways to cash flow off of your apartment complex or multifamily uh, that aren't rent. Like think outside the box. Oh my gosh, I have this asset. You know, twice a year we have these giant events. I'm doing parking. Done. I'm done. It's it's happening. Now you just made 20,000 that you weren't expecting. Like this is the shared economy. You know, you just have to see it in a different manner. Um, you could, if you're a real estate agent, for example, you could drive Uber on the way to showings. This is entirely possible. There's a way now where you can put on there, hey, I'm going to go from point A to point B. And if anyone needs a ride in this time period, I'll take them. You can get paid to drive to work because of the shared economy. I mean, it's fantastic. There are many uh, sites where you can rent out attic space as storage. You can rent out your fishing cabin. It does not have to be fancy. As long as you're honest with people, what you have, there are people that would love to use that, especially any hunting or fishing uh, accommodations. Those are huge. Uh, you can rent your parking space. There are several apps for this. If you have um, a parking space you know, in a city center and you're not using it, get it up on the app. You could be making money every day when you're not there on your parking space and really helping someone, you know, in doing it. So the craziest stuff you've ever heard of, you can cash so on. 
um, you can rent out your home when you're on vacation. I do know families that when they go on vacation, they rent their home out for the week and they will pay for their vacation uh, through that one week rental. I mean, they do it all the time. Is there a little bit of pain in the neck factor? Yes, but they just went to Disney for free. So they're usually okay with it. If you have an RV sitting around, that can be an asset. That can be a huge liability. But RV rental is huge right now. There are two major websites where you can put your RV up and people will rent it from you and pay you very good money. They pay almost what they pay for a hotel to rent these RVs. It's incredible. So RVs are fantastic. If you have one and it's parked in your driveway right now, then this is your kick in the pants to go get that thing up on the web. Like that's a no brainer if you ask me. If you have a tree house, I know it sounds crazy, but you can rent that. Uh, if you have space on your property for a billboard or an antenna, if you have a great roof space for a cell tower, there's so much money in this, okay? Do not discount that. You can make money on your lunch break. You can walk dogs through Rover. Rover is a very well-known app. That's the shared economy. You know, they don't know you, but they're saying, hey, I'll pay you to walk my dog. Thank you so much. That's a great way to make money. Uh, if you have a boat, maybe a jet ski, you can rent those out as well. And then also there's the animal pet rental. Um, there's a little dog, a little um, uh, a wiener dog over in the UK, and he makes great money. He's a ring bearer, you know, a few weekends a month, and he brings in a lot of money for his owner. He's adorable. She has these cute outfits she puts on him, and he's very docile, and he will just walk that ring right down the aisle, and the bride and the groom get all the oohs and ahs and anything is an asset. Okay. I just can't even say that enough. Like there are so many ways to make money right now. It's great. So 2021, the crazy thing is you can literally grow up to be anything. My mother used to be like, don't play video games. You'll never get anywhere doing that. There are guys making millions to play video games. I'm sure some of you are aware of this. I have two sons and they love to watch, or they used to at least, they used to love to watch these guys play. I can't even remember the games. I'm so sorry, but you'd watch like money fly across their screen. It was crazy seeing the kind of money they were making and kids enjoy watching other kids play with toys. They enjoy watching other kids play video games. I mean, you can grow up to be anything you can be a professional jump roper. I mean, if you can get it on social media and people want to watch it, you're going to cash flow. Anything is a skill. I mean, literally anything. So the old adage that your parents used to tell you is really not true anymore. I'm sad to say, but it's exciting to say, you know, I can get paid to do anything if I'm interesting enough. And that's really exciting. And we need to all be taking advantage of this. The bigger you think, the bigger you're going to go, you know, if the first thing you want to do is look around your house, look for opportunities. We're entrepreneurs. Okay. And an entrepreneur, their entire job is to solve problems. And if you can solve a problem for someone, you're going to have a job. My, my particular job is I handle crazy guests and bring cash flow to owners and they don't want to deal with it. They would much rather me deal with it. And that's okay. I'm providing a service and I get a paid paid for that service and then they get the rest, you know? So the concept is great. So, you know, you can always be looking around your home and your community for opportunities because there's a way to cash flow on that. If, if you're providing a service and solving a need, people are going to happily pay you to do that because they won't want to do it. There are many things I don't want to do, you know? The next thing, you know, I do want to mention because we're in real estate is leverage. And that's the greatest thing is that the shared economy can really help you get the cash flow that you need. And then the leverage comes in for the rest. And that really is a big deal that we can, you know, buy a hundred thousand dollar house, for example, with $20,000. I mean, and then our tenant pays the rest off. Like that's huge. So when you think about it, especially if you're looking at multifamily, I'm sure, you know, with you guys being in Joanne's group, you are, um, you know, it's such a blessing to have that leverage. So, you know, if you can come up with the cash to get the asset and then you use leverage for the rest, you can really make some life-changing, you know, decisions in your life that really pay off for you and your family for many years. So between the cash flow and the leverage, you can really buy some pretty major assets. So I just want to encourage you guys. I know, especially when you're looking at big multifamily projects, like you guys probably do, I know it's very intimidating and it's a lot of money, but because of leverage, you're not having to come up with all of it. You just need to come up with some of it. 
And sometimes all it takes is a little bit of creativity and you can do that. I, after this presentation, I just hope you'll look at your income just a little differently. So whatever you have, can you double dip? Like I said, drive Uber on your way to do stuff. Uh, can you cash flow two or three ways off of the same asset? It is possible. We just have to realize that it's possible. Okay. If you have, again, I keep saying multifamily, I'm sorry. Can you put in vending machines? Can you put in paid laundry? You know, think of two or three sources of income that you can add to that, that source that you already have. That can be huge for your bottom line. Um, a big part of the shared economy is embracing originality. The more original, the better. I mean, be an out of the box thinker. Um, you do have to consider this, that it is for the long haul, haul, the shared economy, you know, okay, yeah, sometimes there are some flash in the pan, but when you see people, let's say on social media that are really making a lot of money, it's because they have several million followers and that does not happen overnight. These people do what they do for years and years and years to get those followers and they get paid very well to do that, but it's not an over the night, overnight thing. So I just want to be very clear that I did not just get all these houses to manage in you know, six months, it took years of building my name, building my brand, you know, doing a good job for other people, you know, these things just take time. So don't quit. Don't give up if you get discouraged because there is work involved. But if you hang in there, you will definitely see the results. Um, again, if you can solve a problem, you're going to have a business. It's very important to have a problem that you can solve for people. And then you're going to take all that money and you're going to buy assets with it. Assets are going to bring you cash flow. And that's just going to help you buy more assets. Okay. That's the whole concept. Um, so looking at things differently, we're talking about your car. Okay. Can you double dip? First use, I use my car to get to work. The end. No. Use two. Can I rent it on Turo on the weekends? I don't need two cars on the weekend. I'm usually with my husband. Yeah, I can rent out my car. You know, use three, I can get paid to drive people to work. So I drive my car to work and I also pick up an Uber passenger on the way and an Uber passenger on the way back. Now I've got Uber money times two a day. So that's 14 a week. Now I rented it on Turo on the weekends. That's another. Now we have three sources. Well, one, if you count your job, two Uber, three Turo, three sources. Use four, lease out your parking space when you're not in it. Holy cow. Like that's a car that's been costing you money. And now you're making several thousand a week that's real money and that's really possible. So just be aware, anything is an asset in the shared economy. You just have to be a little bit more creative about it, okay? That's just one example with your car, but I want you to know it's entirely possible. I am not just making this up, okay? It, it can be done. Um, finding your assets a lot of times is difficult. There is one thing I really, uh, I, uh, one story I do wanna tell you, um, I was in Philadelphia a few years ago and we had a large group and we, we got a lot of Ubers and it was great. I mean, I'm sure all of you guys have used Uber at this point. So this one ride, I was very lucky. I got to sit in the passenger seat. And so I love chatting with Uber drivers because again, I've said this 15 times, I'm sorry, but I am an Airbnb host. So I said, Hey, I'm in the shared economy. I'm an Airbnb host. And we started kind of swapping stories, you know, cause you see some kind of crazy stuff. Um, it's, you just never know what's coming. And I know Uber drivers see a lot of crazy stuff. So I really like to hear their stories. So I wanted to share a story and then she started sharing stories. And I really like this lady. She's a middle-aged lady. And, um, so I, you know, once we shared a little bit and I really liked her and, um, she started really telling me what she was doing. And I was so impressed. This woman, uh, you know, she's a single mom. She didn't go to college. She's living in Philly. And she decided she wanted to drive Uber. So she started telling me her story. And she said, you know, I looked up on Uber, what was going to bring in the most money. And I saw that, you know, if I got a car that was a uh, seat seven or eight, I can't remember. I think it was seven. But anyway, uh, she said that was going to bring in the most money. So she said, I bought this car with that in mind. And she said, I do very well driving Uber every day in Philly. I enjoy it. You know, she had some crazy stories, but she really enjoyed her job. She said, well, some days I don't really like, I don't want to drive. I'm tired. She said, I put my feet up on my couch and I put my car up on Uber for an, another driver to use. She said, they pay me $250 a day to use my car to drive their Uber guests. And she said, I do literally nothing. And I was like, awesome. Like, that's not a terrible gig right there. 
And she said, yeah, but that's not all. And I was like, oh, and she goes in the back right now, I have some Uber Eats deliveries. So she's double, triple, quadruple dipping with us, picking up deliveries and then driving us around and then also dropping off the food. And I was like, good for you. Like, I love that. I'm kind of a hustler myself. And I was like, dang, that is fantastic. Like respect, you know? And she said, well, that's not all. And I said, what? (laughs) And she said, well, I like to go to Florida. And I said, oh, I do too. And she said, twice a year, I drove to Florida in my car. She said, there are some websites, some shared economy sites. And, you know, this is an SUV. So she has to measure the cubic space of her trunk, which is, I would assume, pretty good because it's an SUV. She said, I, I, I'm already registered as a driver. She said, I put in the space that I have and my dates and where I'm going. She said, they pay me good money to take, you know, I don't know if cargo is the right word, but pretty good sized packages. They'll put them in her car for her. She drives it down I-95 to Florida and drops it at the location she gets paid great money. She said it pays for a chunk of her vacation. She has a great time in Florida. And then when she's ready to come back, she registers again. Hey, I'm going from here to here. I have this much trunk space. Who has the most, who's paying the most? And she takes that package for them. This is all in the up and up. It's all legal. And I just, this lady just like blew my head off. I was just so impressed with her, you know, just very creative woman and just living a great life. She's, she makes good money. She enjoys what we, what she does. She's her own boss, which that's a big deal with a shared economy. You're completely in charge. No one's going to tell you when to, you know, do stuff. You say, well, now my house is available and now it's not. And now I'm available to drive you. And now I'm not, you know, you are completely in charge and that's a big deal. So I really enjoy meeting people like that. So um, I just want to encourage you that this is something that anyone can do and do well at anyone. You just have to have the work ethic and the hustle. These dollar amounts, they really start to add up. I, you know, I want to encourage you. Sometimes it comes in small and sometimes it comes in big and, um, but really it adds up. And one thing that I've done and my friend Tina definitely did is, um, my shared economy money goes into a separate account. It doesn't go into my general checking account. It's very easy to spend. And so just like my girl that had the money for college, you know, mine goes into a real estate account and I only use that to buy real estate. And I just, I just want to encourage you that it does pile up in there, especially if you just don't touch it, you have a plan, you work hard and you start going, holy cow, my account has enough. I have enough for my down payment or I have enough to get in on the next deal. You've got it, you know, so you have a plan you keep your goal in mind and you save, and then your assets buy you assets. Your first buys your second, sec, first and second buys your third, first, second, third buys your fourth. And you'll be amazed how quickly it snowballs. And this is real stuff. This really is, is doable. So I, I really want to encourage you. I, I'm not here to tell you something crazy that magically might work if you're lucky. These are things that average Joes are doing every day right now. Okay. This is 100% true. Um, again, I keep saying this, I'm sorry, but I love to tell people embrace the weird. Like I like being unique. I I mean, I have a squirrel, my, I name my company after a squirrel. Okay. And, um, I was at a property manager convention back in August in Charleston and I had people there laugh at me and I was like, what? And they're like, Oh, ha ha ha. Sid was here a squirrel. Ha ha ha. And I was like, what's wrong with that? Why can't I name my company after a squirrel? Like, I don't get like, they were literally laughing at me. It was kind of weird. It kind of bothered me. And I came back and I talked to my business coach and I said, you know, they were laughing at me. It was just bizarre. And here they are employees working for, you know, Smith rehab group or Smith real estate group, whatever, boring, you know, like I want to be interesting. I actually have no problem sending out. And he goes, Julie, do you know who gets laughed at all the time? And I said, no. And he goes, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and all these unique guys that are out changing the world with these crazy companies, these guys that are out doing the undoable, they get laughed at. I mean, I can't imagine the stuff people have said to these guys. And if they listened and just tried to fit in and be like everybody else, then they'd be like everybody else. And how sad would that be? Like, I don't think the world would be that interesting. I remember back in the nineties, Richard Branson, he went and flew this crazy air balloon. Like, I don't know if he went around the world, but he might've, it was, I can't remember the details. I'm so sorry, but Richard Branson used to do these insane marketing things just to get his name out there, just to get recognition for his brand Virgin. It, and it worked. I mean, people would be like, what is he doing now? This guy is crazy. They called him every kind of name, 
But guess who's a billionaire today? Richard Branson. And guess who's not? Everybody that was like, I would never do that. So I just want to encourage you that sometimes it really is okay to be interesting and be weird and be different. Because if you're going to get into the shared economy, you are going to be a little bit different. I doubt any of you have friends that drive Uber after work, for example, like, especially if you're a professional. Uh, but so what? I mean, if you have a plan for that, don't don't be ashamed of that. Like you're going to end up with a lot of cash flow real estate because of your actions. And maybe they laugh at you and maybe they say, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Why is she renting out her spare bedroom? I would never. Well, guess who has all the money? You do. Okay. So just try to keep your goals in mind. Sometimes it's hard, you know, to go against the grain a little bit. I've definitely been that person. And, you know, like I said, when I had these other property managers laughing at me, I was like, that's kind of hurtful. Like I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't laugh at you, but then I thought, well, my coach is right. Let him laugh. I'll, I'm going to show him in the end, you know, it's fine. So I just want to really encourage you to, to not worry about that. Okay. Do make your plan, execute on your plan and don't worry about the haters. Just, just let them hate. Haters going to hate. Right. So that is my presentation. My email is here. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And, and in fact, do you have any questions? I would love to know. Uh, if anybody has um, learned something or maybe you thought of, you know, something, I will stop sharing my screen, Joanne, but um, there we go. Sorry. Okay. I hope that maybe you've learned something out of this and you can take that and also bring in cash flow into your own lives. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you, Julie. As always, um, you know, I am always inspired by this presentation just because of the creativity and and just seeing, like you said, outside of the box. So thank you for, for um, sharing that with us. And I'll open Absolutely. up the the, uh, the floor for anybody that has any questions. Um, I did have one question uh, for you. Yeah. You rented out your pool house. Um, you know, that was your first foray into Airbnb. Um, did you also rent out your pool or was it just hey, you? Yes. They use the pool. Okay. I got the right insurance. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Yep. There is a company called proper and they specialize in short-term rental insurance. So I have my nationwide policy on my home, which includes yeah. my, my guest house is what it's called on the policy. And then I got a separate policy that where they are aware that I'm doing short-term rentals and it's insured. They had me put in like depth markers. Like it says five feet now on the, on the pool where it didn't say that before, Yeah. but yes, I mean, that was a big draw for people to stay in the home was to be able to use the pool yeah. and we use it some and we don't use it all the time. And yeah. Yep. Anything I have, if I can cash flow on it, I'm going to do it. Even if it's my pool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the app I think is uh, the Swimply, right. That, that rents out your pool. Yep. That's right. Oh, cool. And that's a big deal. You think growing up, you guys, I don't know about you. I had to go to a hotel to swim in a pool. It was a big deal. So there are a lot of kids and families that would love that. So yeah, you can just run out your pool for a few hours for a birthday party. I mean, there's all different ways. Yeah, no, that's a good Andy, idea. did you think of anything you could cash flow on in your life? Um, there was one that I've been, uh, one of them that you mentioned already, but you didn't, you didn't specify the name, but uh, I have like a, a lot of uh, space in my upstairs house mm -hmm. and I never, I never even go upstairs anymore because I'm like, okay, there's, I, I have an office up there, but I've been working on my laptop and on the dining table all the time. Right. So, so anyway, there's a, yeah, I know there's like uh you can rent out your uh, extra space right on, I think it's called neighbors mm -hmm. or neighbor or something like that.com. Yep. There are several. And, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Anything sitting empty, make it cash flow. Right, right. I actually uh, just listed an Airbnb today. So Good. <laughs> nice. you also have it's children, simple. young kids, so you can put your kids on. Yeah, yeah. I haven't thought about cash flowing the young kids yet, but that's that's definitely different. That's I mean, I, yeah, I understand the whole YouTubing and, and uh, that's a Facebook real deal or right whatever. There. Yeah. I've been amazed at what people make off of their kid doing that and they get free toys out of it. Right. Uh, right. I think last year or the year before the number one YouTuber was a young kid and it, it was like him when he started or his parents started him when he was like one or two. Mm -hmm. And then now he's about like five or six and he's the number one YouTuber 
in terms of like uh, cash flow or whatever the annual revenue for, for right. YouTubers. It's incredible what you can pull off of social media. And yeah. kid, I mean, I would have never thought, hey, I want to watch other kids play with toys, but it's a real thing. <laughs> it really is a real thing. Right. <laughs> And, and I, like, here, like, I guess going back on YouTube, like, uh, like my, my son's a toddler, right? And his, one of his favorite YouTube channels or shows is uh, this guy named Blippy. Okay. And he's this guy that just goes around the uh, like the country going to museums and stuff. And he's showing off like, you know, what things right. are for kids. And, and that's the kids are the one that keep watching it over and over again. And right. they get millions and millions of views. Right. So, right. No, I mean, it's brilliant. And the guy is doing what he loves. Right. And that's the whole concept. Like, I don't want you guys to do something that makes you miserable. I want you to make cash flow off of something that you love doing. I enjoy hosting people weird, but I do. Uh, and, but everyone has a different talent. So, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There's just, it's crazy. You can cash flow on any, you could, there's a, um, there's a guy on YouTube that makes great money and his whole stick is he scares the crap out of his mother. <laughs> and it's funny because he'll like hide and she'll, ah, like she has a, she's just really easy to scare. And it just makes me laugh. And I mean, the guy makes great money scaring his own mother, which there's probably a good corner in hell for him for doing that. But it's really funny. Like she's, you know, she laughs about it, but it's really funny. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, Madaker, did you have a, did you have a question for us? Did you think of something? I think you're muted. Yeah, speak a little louder. Oh. oh. Uh, I think there's a microphone potential issue or something. Can you hear me? Uh, oh, there you go. A little louder. A little louder. Okay. Um, so my question had to do with taxes, right? You know, people with W-2 incomes, you know, at the 35, 36% tax bracket, uh, how much of this cash flow from shared economy is going to end up with Uncle Sam, in your opinion? That's a good question. Well, you know, for me now, when I buy pool chemicals, which I've been buying for almost 20 years, I've lived here, those are now a tax write-off, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things from my own personal home, because, you know, and guess what? I have to mow the lawn over there. So once you have a business, you actually have additional tax write-offs as long as it has to do with that business, you know? So some of the laundry soap I buy is going to be a tax write-off, you know? So it's actually a great way to get write-offs and also live for free or partially free because now you have a business and you you do need to use a lot of those things for business um let's say andy rented out two of his rooms inside his house well now a good chunk of his electric bill is a tax write-off so he's making more money but he also has tax write-offs that he didn't have before he had that income so it's actually a win-win anytime you know the wealthy tend to get wealthy because they own businesses and real estate so the second you start a business you now have business write-offs on the income. So a lot of times- You're filing your income tax returns as a business separate from your personal uh, W-2 income. Yeah. And you know uh, what is the tax rate and is that based on the business revenue P&L statement? Um, this is a good question. I get a, t just talking Airbnb, I get a 1099 on that, okay? So their 1099 me is like a, I was like, I'm a contractor or something like that. And it's then I have my receipt. Income. I'm sorry? 1099 goes to your regular income. Okay. I'm, I am not an accountant, but they're, but it's going to count as income, but it also gives you additional tax for us against it. So a lot of times it's a wash or a loss. It just depends what you're doing. Um, like my property management company, you know, that's going to come in as income, but I also have additional benefits that come with that. So it's a great question, but I wouldn't just not do it because of the taxes. It might actually encourage you to get into it so that you have the tax write-offs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you generate the, the, the expenses from the business help, help offset your income. So that's why she was saying, since she is renting the pool house, now the pool chemicals, which she would have to buy anyway, are a write-off to her business, uh, the Airbnb business of her pool house, because they're used to maintain the pool that gets rented out as part of her Airbnb, so. Yeah, Joanne, I understand that. What I'm asking is, you know, for example, Airbnb sending a 1099. 
then 99 will come in your name right yeah. now if you is uh, if do i need to set up a separate business and rent my rooms under that business so that the business is taxed at, at its income rate versus my 36% tax bracket you can you can do it however you want a lot of people will, like for myself i started everything in my own name and then i moved it into a business once it became big enough so you can do it however you want yeah i would recommend and uh, you actually if you're going to do something opening like an llc just for asset protection right so that way the business is um in an llc and uh, i would recommend talking like with asset protection um, specialists, advisors, um, just because you always want to make sure that you are protecting yourself and your assets. So, you know, it, it, it is advantageous to, to have asset protection um, advisors. Another question related is uh, Airbnb. You know, I know a lot of people do it. Uh, maybe you know, so I'm asking you. Um, did you have to declare this with your insurance company? And you know, because you're liable for anybody hosting, hosting on your property, right? If something goes wrong, they can sue you. If they break their leg, they can sue you, right? Because they were on your property. Simple, right? That's it. So that's why many people get umbrella insurance and this insurance and that insurance. Mm -hmm. The question is, did you have to declare it with your insurance company that you're doing Airbnb for your business, right? Yes. Many, many HOAs don't even allow Airbnb, right? right. In, uh, HOA, then they won't even allow Airbnb. More important, even if it's allowed, did you have to declare it with your insurance company? Absolutely. You always want to be upfront with your insurance company, what you're doing. Um, it's not even worth having insurance if they're going to cancel it on you the second you get a claim. So you want to be very honest about that. They know exactly what I'm doing. You know, you would always email my agent in writing and it's official. So yeah, you have to be uh, up front, but that's what insurance is for. And, you know, if there is an issue, which I've had thousands of guests with very hardly any issues, you know, that's, that's where they're going to go is to the insurance company. That's that they always kind of want the easiest possible, the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak. So um, you also have coverage through the platforms that you're advertising on as well. Like they're going to cover you. Uh, you know, there's just many different ways uh, okay. to go about it. But I just want to say, if you think about all that before you even get started, you probably won't start. So figure out what your niche is, start making money and going, yes, I can do this. And I'm really good at it. And just figure it out as you go. You don't have to know everything before you get started. The hardest part is actually just getting started and you figure it out as you go. Uh, there are a lot of great people out there uh, with answers to every question that you kind of come upon, but insurance is one of the easier parts that, you know, that's very simple. But you definitely want to be honest about everything. You don't want to do it in an HOA. If it's not allowed, you don't do it. I, I live on property, so no one can tell me I can't do it. It's my my property. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit more rural, but I manage in many cities. And um, that's why one of my specialties is what I call long short. There are many places where you can't do an Airbnb. But my target audience is professionals that travel for work, or maybe they can work from anywhere. They're in the tech field and they can stay for 30 days or more. And now I don't need a special policy. I don't need a special insurance policy. I don't need a special certificate or license. I do 30 days or more. And it's considered a long-term rental, even though the home is furnished and has great internet and a desk and everything. So um, I am a hustler. I am going to figure out a way to make it work for whatever market is in, whether it's legal or illegal, I'm going to do it the legal way, but it's going to be a minimum night, say of 30 days, for example. So, um, a no is just, I don't always take no. I just go, okay, well, I still want to do this. So just here in Savannah, I've been able to buy regular houses in regular neighborhoods where you're not allowed to make it an Airbnb. It's against the law, but I still have the house on Airbnb, but it's 30 days or more. So, it's not, it's completely legal. That's the most growing part of their um, platform is the 30 days or more. And that's probably half of my portfolio. Uh, so I'm an out of the box thinker. I have no problem telling you that. And I do things legally. I'm not here to do anything illegal. I have a lot to lose if I don't. Um, but I just, I don't just say, oh no, I got to know I'm out. No, if someone tells me no, I'm like, well, let me just figure out a different way. Cause I know this is a great location. So that's my encouragement for you. Midterm rentals. Mm-hmm. 
love them. I love, I love them all, but I love the professional guests, especially if I was already doing this before COVID. I just want to brag about that. I was already into the space and then COVID hit. And I went from a one page waiting list to a three page waiting list, you know, like now everybody can work from home and they want these furnished rentals with phenomenal internet. In fact, I have a website coming right now. We have a, um, a Chrome extension for it. It's called Ophi. If, if, if anyone's in the tech world, you can use our Chrome extension to get on Airbnb and find the houses with the best workspaces and internet. And it's a huge asset to these traveling professionals. They can work from Maui. They can work from Croatia. It doesn't matter. As long as they show up for work and do their job, their location doesn't matter. I'm going after those guys. I want them to stay in my properties. You know, so that's why I moved out nationwide. I've got houses coming up everywhere. And I absolutely love it. And it's very legal in almost any location. Some HOAs have a six month minimum. I don't rent there. That's rare. That's the exception. That's definitely not the rule. So I just want to encourage you. That's my niche. And I go hard after that, but you may have something that's even better. You know, I don't know. So anyway, Debbie, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank you for oh. this. This was really interesting. And, uh, and I kind of had two questions, but you yeah. touched on one of them already, which was, um, I think, uh, Matt Hukar, I, I'm butchering your name, I'm sure. But um, so even if you're doing something like just renting out, say, a room or two rooms of your house, something like that on a service like Airbnb, you would recommend possibly forming a company to do that just to protect yourself a little bit versus doing it in your name? Uh, if it's your personal home, it's a little more difficult I mean, I, I'm not like a tax accountant or an attorney. My, my pool house is in my personal name. Okay. Every other property that I rent out is in an LLC. I just have an umbrella policy on my home. I had it anyway. I already had the umbrella policy. I didn't get it just because I was Airbnb, but you know, it's your personal home. You let them know what's going on. Get a, like I said, I have a proper, it's called proper. It's for short-term rentals. I have a proper policy on top of my regular homeowner's policy. My agent is well aware of what I'm doing. And she goes, if you get a claim for an Airbnb guest, for example, she said, we're not going to tell nationwide. We're only going to tell proper and they'll cover it. But if let's say, you know, a tree falls on something, then I'm just going to go to nationwide. So like, I have a double policy, if that makes sense, just because it's my personal home. Uh, okay. but there's always a way don't take a no just figure it out like every i know there's a book out there everything is figure outable like it's easy to get hung up on little stuff and go oh i can't i don't know about the insurance it's it's doable there's so many people out there to ask um there are a ton of facebook groups for airbnb hosts and you know let's say you want to get into tour turo for example there's a ton of groups for that too you can just easily post a question that's how I learned the shared economy actually was getting into these groups and just listening to the crazy questions that the host had or listening to the crazy stories. And then I'd read the comments. I learned Airbnb law that way. And now you, you can't come anywhere near me. If I'm filing an insurance claim, I know what I'm doing because I educated myself. You know, I just hung out with a bunch of people that were doing it. So whatever you get into, you can learn the space. Okay, thanks. And I guess my second question, you just touched on it just now, actually a little bit, um, which was, you had that slide, I think it was the box where you were talking about different ideas, including that yeah. Air P and P, and which I've never even heard of. So uh, that was kind of my question was, how do you even hear about some of these things? Um, because it's just, if you don't know about it, it's not something you can Google, right? Unless you do something really yeah. vast, like, you know, Googling shared economy or whatever, and you start pouring through things, but, you know, other than doing something like that, how do you hear about all of these different things? Um, this day and age, information is everywhere. You guys, we're so spoiled. We don't even realize it. Like you have, and you carry around in your pocket every day, the answer to every question you could ever answer, ask almost is just in your cell phone. So let's say I got the rights to Air P&P. Okay. Let's just, I don't know how to do that, but I would, I would, I would love to do that. If someone can help me, let's say I bought that domain and I created the platform, but nobody knows about it. Okay. Are you, am I answering your question with the beginning of what I'm saying? So I decide I have this crazy concept, the crazier, the better, right? It's easier to get people to hear about me. The weirder I am, the more you get looked at today, right? Social media everywhere. So let's say I say, Hey guys, I have Airbnb. come join my site. The first thing I'm just going to put it out on social media, the weirder, the better that that's the stuff that gets shared. If I video my cat sleeping on the couch, 
who's going to watch that? Nobody. But if I, you know, video my cat falling off an 80 foot roof and running away, everyone wants to see that. It's weird, right? It's unheard of. So Airbnb, anything with a shared economy, the weirder you are, the more unique, the easier it is to get eyeballs on it. So it's really not that difficult to generate buzz. Um, maybe I do an AdWords campaign or a Facebook marketing, uh, you know, Instagram campaign around people that are going to Mardi Gras, for example, and I just say Airbnb, Airbnb, Airbnb. It's such a weird concept that I think people really enjoy talking about stuff like that. Um, but it's really not as hard as you would imagine. Um, you just have to have the concept first and go after it. Again, I'm a hustler. I will hustle for whatever it is I'm going after, but I, I can think of 20 ways I would market it right now. <laughs> okay. I, well, I thank you. This You're was welcome. really interesting and, yeah, and kind go of big. enlightening for me. So go crazy, do something weird. I will cheer for you the whole way. Like, I love it. I, I don't like boring people. I like fun, interesting. Well, it shows too. I can see it in your face and voice. So that's, that's pretty cool. Oh, good. I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope nobody was bored. <laughs> Never. Well, I, have, I have a quick uh, follow-up question yeah. to Debbie's. Um, so because there's so many uh, uh, of those examples that you gave, is there a list of other apps or websites that are coordinating with some of those uh, topics or shared economies that you're talking about? You know what, Andy, there are millions. Um, I I did a lot of research for this presentation and um, I guess I, I could have put the names in, but just like, there's so many, there's so many names for the same concept. You actually can't run out of space. So I just did the concept. Um, but yeah, if you just Google the shared economy and different things, I mean, you'll be amazed. It's like, a, it's like a rabbit hole. You go down and you just keep going deeper. And it's really exciting to see what people are doing. Um, so I really want to encourage you to figure out something that interests you in particular, and you'd be amazed at what's out there, but maybe you can make it better. Maybe you can get on board with someone else is already doing, or maybe you can make it better. Um, I've branched off into technology now, and I'm, I'm partnering with a couple of technology um, companies, and I am going to, I'm going to set the category on these 30 day or more rentals. That's my niche. And that's, that's what I do every day. And um, I'm really trying to take it over. You know, that's kind of a big deal to me is just to kind of own that category, even though I do regular short-term rentals as well. But that's my weird thing that I'm obsessed with. For you, it's going to be something different, but just go after it. It's really, the, the sky is the limit. I mean, it's crazy the, the, what you can do these days with very little. Yeah, I had a, um, a quick question and I know we're, we're um, going past the hour and thank you, Julie, again for, for being uh, with us. Um, I just had one last question um, regarding what you were saying with these 30 day rentals. Um, you know, you always see, you know, different counties. OK, they've hit their short uh, term rental uh, allowances or licenses right. and things like that. Do you find that by doing the 30 day that that um, allows you to mm -hmm. um, go, get past that, like um, get around that? And how do you find out if that's allowed? You just contact the county and, and yep. ask. You are considered a short-term rental. It, under 30 days is considered a short, you can Google it. So many cities have no regulations, okay? And many cities have a lot of them. And I've heard of a couple of cities that have a six month minimum, but that's again, unheard of. But for multifamily, Joanne, I know you're in that space. I work with a lot of investors and I tell them, I'm like, just give me the stuff you can't rent, which is usually is the studios and the one bedroom. So it's tend to be a little bit harder. Excuse me. Those are perfect for long shorts because it tends to be one or two people. You put in one bed, one dresser, one couch, one TV and great internet and a desk. And they're going to come stay there. If it's in a great location, you can attract travel nurses. You can travel tech people up. Uh, you know, maybe someone moving in the, out of the area. I have one house here in coastal Georgia. It's about an hour from me. I mean, there's an FBI training center near there. I mean, who would think of that? But this place stays full. They always bring these guys in for training at the FBI facility. If there's industry around that place, it's usually a really great place for a long short. And especially if Airbnbs aren't allowed or highly regulated, you can still get in there with as many long shorts as you want. Um, if anyone's interested, you know, email me. I did a podcast about these long shorts and it's about an hour long if you can take another hour of me um but it's a lot of information on this and i can send it to you if you're interested so yeah if you if you guys have real estate and you want someone like myself to come in and manage it for you and help it cash flow that's what my, that's what i do so and i didn't mean to make it a plug for that but no no, no worries 
Yeah, so. definitely. It, just send me that information. I'll connect with you okay. later. I'll post it in yeah. the, the YouTube uh, description okay. for, um, for people. So. Yeah, that's my very much out of the box way of coming at these furnished rentals. And it's gone gangbusters. It's been huge because there's a big need. I, I noticed, I, I mean, I didn't really say this in my presentation, but when I had my pool house and starfish, people were wanting them for several months at a time. And I didn't really want them to do that because it's my property and I didn't really want to be stuck with them. So I said, there's a need. So my third furnished rental was actually a long short. It's in a part of Savannah where I cannot have a short-term rental certificate. I bought a house for $51,000. And today I rented out for 25, 2,700 a month. And it, I mean, maybe two, three, four nights a year are empty. Uh, it's just in a fantastic location and it's a regular house and in a regular neighborhood. Okay. It's not a mansion. It's just a little three, one, uh, but I'm just looking where nobody else is looking and that's real estate, right? You always want to kind of be looking where no one else is looking. Exactly. So anyway, cash flow is definitely there. You just may have to think a little bit differently to get it, but I love to maximize cash flow on just a regular asset. The former landlord was getting six fifty a month and now I'm getting 26 50 a month. You know, that's pretty crazy. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, all right. Well, Julie, I appreciate it very much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Andy and Debbie, for joining. Madhikar had to, to drop, but I appreciate this. And I will be posting this up on YouTube and I'll let you guys know the link. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. And I thank you so much. Thanks, right. Julie. Thanks, Joanne. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good night.